Um, huh. Interesting. I, yeah, all I like these new things like StreamYard and. Yeah, I just got to hit my intro if it works. Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes it works. Like Back to another episode of the Typical Skeptic Podcast. I have a return guest with me today, um, someone who, whose work I really think is just fascinating. Like, um, I would say she's one of the best quantum hip healing hyp hypnotists doing it right now. Who I have with me is Sarah Bressman Cosme. She's the best selling author of A Hypnotist Journey to Atlantis and A Hypnotist Journey to the Secrets of the Sphinx. Sarah is a master hypnotist, level three practitioner of Dolores Cannon's QHHT, and a student of Dr. Brian Weiss. Now featured on Gaia TV, Sarah continues to speak about her um, her work worldwide. Now, her new book is going to is, is called um, "A Hypnotist Journey from the Trail to the Star People." I think I got that right, and we're going to be yeah, talking about that today. But the, Sarah, thank you for joining me. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be on your show. This is awesome. Like, so um, I guess before we get into the new book, like for fans who might be like kind of like new to your work, like, can you tell them like how you got into hypnosis and then what what led you to read to write your first two books? Well, honestly, I wasn't into any of this stuff at all. I wasn't into aliens or past life regression or anything. I just was somebody that had a ton of problems myself. So eventually that led me to kind of look into ways to help myself. Um, I had gone through regular therapy when I was younger and I wanted to just be a therapist or a psychologist actually is what I really wanted to do. And I went to college to do this. And when I was in college, I realized that when I was away, I had changed my thoughts and changed my environment. And literally I changed my life by changing my patterns. So I thought, wow, this is so amazing. This helped me so much. And that just stuck with me for the rest of my life. Just how amazing it was that I could change so much about my life by changing my patterns and my thoughts. But anyway, I still graduated from college. And before going to graduate school, I had an internship where my job was to basically counsel people and then give them their medications because I was about to go to graduate school to finally become a psychologist. Um, oh, I'm freezing up. Is it okay? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Um, so when I internship, I realized that everything that I had learned in college for me, it just seemed like it was a lie because it didn't seem like this was really the best thing to help these people. I mean, I thought that this was like the leading edge of thought, you know, that this was the best way to help people with mental illnesses. And it just, it didn't, I thought there must be something more. So I quit. I, I didn't continue. I didn't become a psychologist. In fact, later down the road, I decided to get into hypnosis because I had learned a little bit about regression therapy. And I thought, wow, I really want to help people. And I know this can help people. So I started um, into regression therapy. And in order to become a master hypnotist, because I have this perfectionism problem, you had to do lose weight, quit smoking and past life regressions. So I thought, I don't really know about this past life regression stuff, because I was more scientific. And I wasn't really sure if I believed in past life regressions. But I just had to do it. So I started, I did a few. And right away, I noticed something that there was something about these past life regressions where people could actually heal themselves. So even though I was doing lose weight and quit smoking hypnosis, they just were they paled in comparison to the profound healing that people could experience with these past life regressions. So I studied with Dr. Brian Weiss, and then I got really good at his method, did that for many years until I felt like something was missing in my life. And I contacted a psychic and she said, 
oh my gosh, Sarah, this is like the easiest reading I've ever done because, you know, everybody has different future potentials, but yours is so obvious to me. The reason why you feel like something is missing is because you're supposed to do Dolores Cannon's method of, of QHHT. And I had never heard of her because this world was really new to me. And the psychic said, yeah, you're going to get really good at her method and you'll be um, teaching it and you'll be writing books and speaking about it all over the world. And, you know, that sinking feeling when you have a bad psychic thing, oh my gosh, I'll just, you know, be polite and listen and then just thank her. I honestly thought she was talking about somebody else because I thought there's no way I would be speaking, you know, or writing books. I'm not a writer. So I just didn't believe it. And months later, I finally looked into this Dolores Cannon person. And right away when I did, everything kind of clicked within me. And just like the psychic said, I worked my way up from the, the ground up and I became uh, one of the top people in the field. And then I started teaching it all over the world with um, Dolores Cannon's daughter, Julia. And then I wrote books and started speaking about them all over the world. That's how I got into this. Just seems like by accident. And anyway, my psychic's name is Emma McIntosh, Emmanuel McIntosh. She's very good. She lives in France, but she speaks English. Oh, I, maybe I should have her. I have psychics on every week because I'm a real big believer it is in It's amazing. Sci. You know, what's really funny is that later she reached out and asked me to do an interview with her. And I said, do you know who I am? Like, do you remember? You gave me a reading a long time ago. And so she looked through her, her notes and figured it out. So yeah, you should have her on. She's a, she's amazing. That would you, be really you, cool, you, actually. Do you follow um, Dolores is like, um, I, 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 it's been a long time since I read her work, but I, I know what she, she, she did for the world. And like, did you, did you see a big difference in between Brian Weiss and Dolores Cannon's methods? Like, because they're both masters at what they do, but like, where does Dolores Cannon take it to the next level? So, you know, um, Brian Weiss's method is absolutely fantastic. And I really needed that method to um, get into all of this stuff because I really uh, resonated with the fact that he was scientific and he was a psychiatrist. And so I just wasn't ready to go from A to Z right away. And um, Dolores Cannon takes everything to a different level. So Brian Weiss's method is amazing and it works really well and it's great. What Dolores Cannon does that's different, and I'm not saying it's better in any way, it's just different, is that the whole aim of the session isn't really to go to a past life. Yeah, that's part of it. But the aim is to access the higher self, access the higher consciousness. That's the aim of the session. The two sessions, the two types of sessions are different in their goals because Brian Weiss um, is really known for these past life regressions, bringing a person to a past life and uncovering that and then finding out how that relates to their current life, which is fantastic. But Dolores Cannon's um, method really go gets to the higher consciousness because when you access the higher consciousness of a person, there's a bunch of things that happen. Not only do you access universal consciousness, because when you go deep within one person you or with anyone, you access the same place and it's universal consciousness, which is something I started to learn over the years as I thought your consciousness was different than you know somebody else's but no when you go within anyone you reach the same place that's why it's true we really are all one we really come from the same place but when you access the higher self the higher consciousness you can find out anything about your client you can find out like their true purpose why they're there and they can even heal their body which is one of the reasons why qhht is so popular these days because people can heal themselves so easily especially right now, especially with the, the way the consciousness on the planet has risen so much. I mean, basically all you have to do is really go inwards and focus within yourself and find out what the message the body is sending because the body is a messenger. And we were never taught this in school. And it's a shame because it's just like our emotions, how we're supposed to feel and listen to our emotions. We're really supposed to listen to our body. And we were never taught how the body works and how the body communicates with us, but the body communicates with us in a literal language. 
Like whatever is going on with your body is really literal. Like the right side of the body is stuff that's going on right now. The left side is usually something in the past, sometimes a past life. The eyes are usually some, whether or not you don't want to see or see clearly or see far or see close. And same with ears. I mean, the body is a literal messenger. And so once you can understand the message, it can instantly be released and healed. The body doesn't have to keep the message. And that's really all that it is. It's that simple. That's amazing. It, it, I think it's amazing. I do agree with you that like we're in like this like time of like consciousness expansion. Like I don't know if it's like, you know, like the new age people say that we're going to like 5D or or what's exactly going on. But I do see like a great awakening. What, what I wanted to ask you is this. When you do these sessions, I don't know if I ever asked you this. Like I'm really interested in the like in the in between life. Um, I, oh, you know, I know, um, Richard Martini talks about it. He's a hypnotist. Um, and, uh, I can't remember who he studied under, but he, he's really good with it. And he talks about in between life. Like, have you had a lot of people go to the in between life? Like, like once they, cause I've had past life regressions done and I, went through the death phase and then I, my consciousness left my body. Then next thing, you know, I felt like one, the one time I did feel like I was in a classroom and I, I, I didn't know if this was weird or if this was common, like, um, is this common? Do we go to a classroom when we pass on or like, is there like a in between life? Yes. And many people describe going into these classrooms where they can learn different things. I mean, you can learn anything, in the in between, just like you can do this when you're dreaming too. I mean, people leave their consciousness, consciousness leaves the body and you can go back to these classrooms and get back to your, you know, families on the other side also, but everyone goes to the same place. And I find it fascinating, even um, when people are remembering being an extraterrestrial, everyone goes to the same place. Everyone's part of the same source. Doesn't matter what race you are or where you come from, it's all, the same place. Um, but it's really quite fascinating, the in-between, because in, aside from the classes, where not only can you learn about the, the next incarnation that you want to experience and the different types of things that you might um, encounter in these classes, sometimes people remember teaching the classes and sometimes they remember teaching about manipulating energy or, you know, all different kinds of things. But it's really neat because people can drift and float and experience different parts of history where they can find out so much in the in-between. But, you know, when you leave your body and you go back to the in-between, you know everything again. So being here on earth and experiencing the amnesia is quote unquote fun experience in a sense. I mean, not so much fun, but a real experience. It's like you're playing a video game and you're really in this video game because when you leave, you go back and you remember everything again, you're reunited once again. So this is just supposed to be a big class, a big, you know, experience for us. And then uh, this is one I wanted to ask you, cause like, I know like this is a hot topic right now. And, and so I wanted to get your opinion on it. Like, and I, I think I know what you're going to say, but like, okay. So there's the people that will say that we're in like a matrix and this, this is a soul trap. Like, what are your, what is your response to that? Like, I, I'm not really sure. I don't think it is. I would say maybe we're in some kind of place where we learn lessons, but like, what are your thoughts on the whole like soul trap concept? Like, you know what I'm saying? Well, like they say that we reincarnate yeah. that like the entities feed off our energy and all that. It's like a, like our louche. And it's like a, it's a, it's a really down way to look at the, the, our existence, but I'm open to anything. So I don't doubt it, but at the same time, I don't completely agree with it either. Well, the consciousness of, or the soul is so powerful and you come in for this experience that basically you're rendering your life you're basically creating your your life we think we're we are sort of co-creating but like each person has like a bubble of their own reality and we kind of like bump up against somebody else's bubble but ultimately you are the one that's creating it so if you fully believe this then it can be true for you but I don't receive this from the higher self. I've asked this question before, is this a soul trap? And the answer that I got is that no, but if you believe it to be, then it could be for you. Basically, 
each person is rendering, like they're rendering through their the filter of their eyes, what they're experiencing along with what they're creating. So if you didn't have your eyes and you didn't have this experience, it would all look kind of like muddled and, and dark. So we're, we're literally focusing and creating. And people explain when they go back to the in-between that this is not as real. This physical reality doesn't feel as real as it does when you go back to the in-between. It's like you feel more real, if that makes sense. Like that's more real. You know that you are all connected and that you are basically God in a sense, you are source. That's amazing. Now, uh, for the fans that don't know, I want to get into your new book, but I just want to give people like a little bit of a background on you. So like, I know you, this all started when you were working with Jen and she had a condition. I had her on my show recently, again, to help her promote her new book. But um, it, it's amazing what you two were able to do. Like, I mean, you know, like two books on her end and two books on your end, um, came from your sessions together. Right. And like, um, yeah. how did that all start? Oh my gosh. It was so crazy because who knew I had no idea any of this was going to happen. And, um, I needed somebody to regress so I could take the submission and take it to, um, this class that I wanted to take because I was finally able to take, uh, level three, which is the the highest level class and it was in florida and i live in florida so i needed somebody on the spot and somebody really quickly and i just felt like asking my friend jen and i've been friends with jen for 10 years and we had sat after school at, on the playground while we watched our kids play and she was a teacher at the school so she was really scientific and i knew she wasn't into any of the stuff so when i asked her I instantly regretted it because I thought to myself, why did I just do that? Why did I just ask her to be my volunteer when I could have asked one of my open friends? Because I had tried to bring up spiritual topics with Jen before, and I knew she wasn't into it at all. It, what She didn't believe in any of this stuff. And she wasn't even sure if she believed in extraterrestrials because I asked her and she said she wasn't sure. They made her uncomfortable. So... When I asked Jen if she would be my volunteer because I wanted to take this class and I want to regress her and I told her a little bit about it and that she could heal herself in these sessions and that healing was really easy. She looked at me and she just said, what? Because she was suffering from this brain condition. And so she volunteered to be my subject because she the, the um, team of specialists, special specialist that she was working with said there was no cure and they had her had her on heavy duty medications so she was you know really excited to give something new a try and it, during our first session she went back to this past lifetime where she lived in this place called Amon which we found out later was Lemuria and she lived as this princess basically and knew so many details about this land in the South Pacific, how it was a matriarchal society and the women were the natural leaders because they carried this su special subconscious knowledge or they carry the knowledge sub and pass it um, from mother to daughter subconsciously. Anyway, she was taken as a prisoner by these very advanced people um, that we found out were the Atlanteans and lived as a prison prisoner for 60 years on Atlantis. And wow, that was just so fascinating to the both of us. But still, I was a little bit skeptic because I've heard so many past life stories. But I asked her higher self, why did you show her this lifetime of all lifetimes? And they said it was important for the both of us to uncover this information and share it with the world because the world needed it so badly. And I asked her higher self, well, why does she have this brain condition? And they said, because it was the catalyst to get her to see me. She wouldn't have wanted to do this session if she didn't have some kind of issue that required some healing. Otherwise, she wouldn't have had any motivation. So that's how this all started. And we were able to find out so much about these ancient civilizations. And, you know, I was able to trust the information better knowing Jen and knowing her for so long and knowing that she didn't have any previous knowledge about any of these ancient civilizations and also knowing how she 
didn't really believe in extraterrestrials, when she remembered being an extraterrestrial, it just really validated things for me. And just the details were astounding. I mean, she remembered like being a commander of an extraterrestrial ship and so many details. And just that she was part of this hybridization program, stuff she never knew consciously. And it was amazing because since the higher consciousness told us that this was so important for us to share with the world, I wanted to get to the very beginning. I wanted to get the beginning of the story that they wanted us to share with the world. And so when I asked, she didn't start from the beginning of that lifetime in Lemuria at all. She started from the beginning when she needed to come to Earth to seed Earth because they were running out of resources on her planet. It was just so fascinating. So, you know, she wrote her own firsthand perspective. And I wrote um, my book, A Hypnotist's Journey to Atlantis with other past life regression stories, because really strangely enough, not that this isn't enough woo woo, but this weird phenomenon started happening in my office that I thought was just a coincidence at first. People who didn't know one another and didn't know that I was working with Jen started coming in for their sessions with me and they would regress right back to the same time period in either Atlantis or Lemuria, or they were an extraterrestrial crash landing on earth. And I started asking my other coworkers, are you guys experiencing this as well? And no, they weren't. And the higher consciousness kept saying, Sarah, you need to put all this stuff in a book. You have to do this. You have to share it with the world and we'll help you. And so I started writing everything down and I started compiling all the stories and it, you know, as soon as I published my first book, they weren't lying. I never, I self-publish my books. I self-publish them. They put it all out there. It's not me. It's really, really strange, but there's such a weird element of, I guess you would call it magic intervention because the higher consciousness that basically writes this book, I wish I could take credit and say, yes, oh, I'm such a great writer, but no, I'm not the one writing these books at all. It's written by the higher consciousness that comes to the clients with an agenda. The higher consciousness has an agenda and it wants to share all this information. I'm the facilitator and I'm just a willing participant in all of this basically. That's fascinating. That really is like, and the fact that like Jen was able to like heal her condition through hypnosis, it makes me wonder like that, like, you know, I've, I've had five past life regressions done now because I'm, I'm a big fan of it. And like, I was thinking that like you go into this such, you go in such a deep, 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 deep relaxation that like, it would seem that that would be the perfect, um, place for healing. And I was thinking like, maybe that's something that's supposed to happen when we sleep, but maybe it doesn't because, um, when we sleep, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, like your mind sometimes races, like, um, you know, like it's not, it's not as restful. Sometimes sleep isn't as restful as it should be because we have so much on our mind from the day-to-day basis. But when you're in a hypnosis session, you're, um, you're, you're just like in this deep state of relaxation where like, I think miracles can happen. Would you agree? I agree. I mean, sleep is very healing as well. <clears throat> That's often what, to, why people put other people in comas when they really need deep healing. But one of the reasons why these quantum healing hypnosis sessions work so well right now is because the conscious mind and the higher conscious mind are merging. So back when I started doing this in 2009, I noticed a big difference. And I noticed um, Dolores Cannon, when she wrote her books, there was a big difference in uh, the way the separation between the conscious and the higher self were back when Dolores was doing her books, because there was a big separation. So it would be like the person would be unconscious when you would reach the higher consciousness. Now it's people are becoming their higher self. I mean, the brain is evolving, whether people notice this or not, I notice this. So the reason why healing is so easy right now is because the consciousness can understand. So the subconscious knows what's going on with the person. But when the consciousness and subconscious agree, 
then it's instant healing and people can heal so many different things. Does that make sense? Not to, um, Hypnosis. No, that's awesome. <laughs> okay. that, that makes perfect sense. But now, I, so I wanted to like kind of transition into your new book, um, A Hypnotist Journey from the Trail of Tears to the Star People. This is a, this sounds amazing. Like I know people in the comments were saying that they were excited to hear you talk about this. And I don't think you've talked about it on a podcast yet. So I feel kind of honored that I'm the, or maybe you have, but I, I feel like honored to, to have you on to talk about it. Um, what was the impetus for this? Like, how did this get started? Well, you know, this, this is fun for me, uncovering this information. I never know what the higher consciousness is going to share with me next. I don't know what kind of story they're going to share. And right before this first session with my latest subject, hypnosis subject, I was um, just had a regular client and he came in for a session and he remembered an extraterrestrial lifetime where he was going to different realms and he was um, kind of experimenting with the different substances that they had, whether it was like a gas liquid or a solid. And he had this equipment on his ship and he would focus consciousness into these different um, objects to see if it would spark a reaction. And if it did, he knew he could, um, create some sort of society on these realms. So anyway, I asked his higher consciousness, why would you show him this? And they said, because they wanted him to understand the energetics of a human and that he was part of the team that designed a human and, and the humans were designed because they're in a way that their um, emotions would be gateways through the universe. And humans don't really understand how powerful their emotions were. And so they taught, the higher consciousness taught my client um, how to use his emotions correctly for manifestation. So this was really interesting to me. I, I was listening in with, you know, um, and writing things down. And they said, so basically focus on a really powerful, positive emotion. And whenever a human is focusing on a powerful emotion, it's opening up gateways and opening up um, portals where there's possibilities. So they told him to focus on a really positive emotion and what's happening is that it's opening up a portal and then pull through the portal whatever he wants and so i thought well i'm going to try this and i'm going to just ask the universe i'm ready for a new subject i'm ready for a new thing <laughs> and i did this my eyes were still closed and my phone pinged and that might not sound like who cares about that but my phone was set to silent and it was literally on silent. And I still didn't think, oh, maybe the universe actually gave me what I was just asking for. I thought, how did this message get through? It was on Facebook Messenger. And it was this woman named Les. And she said she had this weird feeling like she had to contact me right then and there. And she didn't know why. See, I already learned from over the years that there are no such things as coincidences. So I thought, no, it doesn't sound weird, even though she kept telling me she, she thought she sounded like a lunatic. And I said, no, you don't sound like a lunatic. I didn't tell her what, that I had just done this, this meditation or anything. I just asked her if she would be interested, interested in talking more. And then as we got to talking, I asked her if she would be interested in having a hypnosis session because she couldn't figure out why she needed to contact me. She had no idea. She couldn't figure it out. So when she came in for a session, I brought her deep under hypnosis and instantly this other voice came through and it was, it was really amazing. It, it was still her, her voice, but it was like masculine sounding and had a different accent. And the voice said, my name is Anna Wyatt and I'm the one who contacted you. I've been watching you to see if you could get, or I've been watching you so that you could gain our trust. And now that you've gained our trust, I'm ready to tell our story now. And apparently this, this man um, named Anna Wyatt was a past life version of my client Les, but also a parallel version because he claimed he was very much alive and that he was walking what we would call the trail of tears but he was um, able to do this meditation, something he had perfected, and he was able to focus his consciousness into another um, lifetime so he could tell the story of what was happening to him. And so um, when I brought Les out of hypnosis, our first session, I asked her, have you 
ever heard of this person named Anna Waya before? And she said that was her imaginary friend when she was younger. And now she realized that wasn't an imaginary friend at all, that he was actually contacting her back then. Um, and I've noticed that that's sometimes the case, that these imaginary friends are not really actually imaginary friends are just other versions of ourselves coming to check on ourselves. So anyway, Les um, told me that she, her grandmother was Cherokee because Anna Wyatt claimed that he was um, a Cherokee. And so we uncovered his firsthand perspective of what it was like for him. And it was nothing like anything I had ever heard before. I mean, I just had no idea what it was like to walk the trail of tears it was it was horrific i mean it well, wait it was terrible. For, for the people that don't know because i'm not i don't i'm not really familiar like tell us about the trail of tears like i think we need sure. a little background like what's that all about like so okay the trail of tears was the um indian the native american removal act where they forced these Native Americans out of their lands and forced them to walk to Oklahoma. And it wasn't really just as simple as that. It wasn't that they were simply just forcing people out of their lands. It was more like genocide. I mean, as Anna Wyatt described his accounts of, of walking this, he described how, you know, the white men that were forcing them out of their lands would kill them, shoot them just for target practice, rape the women. I mean, it was just horrific. It was nothing like anything I had ever heard before. It's like hard to even talk about. Um, but That's as horrible. he was yeah. describing, as he was de just describing all this, you know, it was interesting to find out more about what what they believed and what they knew and their connection to the star people. They had such a strong connection to the star people and to um, the Nunehe, as Anna Wyatt called them, these, the little people, um, the, basically like the fairy realm. They had connections that the white men didn't have. But it was interesting to find out so much about about these connections and just the ancient ancestors. They could connect through... Um, uh, Anna Waya's mother, who had passed, she could connect him to other chiefs, other tribes, and other ancient ancestors. And I was able to find out so much um, through these connections. But during the whole thing, because it was just so upsetting to me, I asked Anna Waya, why did the white men do this? Like, why? This is just so horrific. How could anybody, a person, do this to another person? And his answer was so shocking to me. Anna Waya said the white men were some of the earliest victims of this negative energy that asserted itself onto the planet, that the white men used to have a culture and that was stolen from them so long ago that now they don't even remember they have a culture. They didn't remember they had a culture, but before they, their culture was stolen from them, they used to be pagans, they used to be witches, they used to have... Um, kind of like a culture that was close to the earth, just like everybody else's original culture, but it was all taken from them, hidden from them. And then they were just walking around, not even knowing that this was taken from them. And I thought that was really interesting that a lot of the, um, the tr a lot of the tribes kind of had this understanding. They never said it was okay, but they understood uh, what really happened to the white man, so to speak. So that was really question. interesting. Yeah. Do you think that that was because of the um, the big push for Christianity? Like that, that, like that there was like this big, you know, like that people were basically making people like, it was like, it was almost like at a point where it was like, either you become a Christian or you die. Like it, it was, it was yeah. weird because if you go back in history, it was like, it was, uh, it was like uh, where they were persecuting people for being Christians back in the time of, Jesus or whatever, but then all of a sudden the Roman Catholic Church, um, Constantinople or Constantine um, reforms that and he makes the Holy Roman Empire and then they start to monopolize on Christianity and then they start to make everybody yeah. want to convert to Christians and all those places where 
like the the white man would have came from like the british owls and like ireland and scotland and you know maybe that that was maybe some of our earliest settlers here um they had like we like you said the druids um and they had the pagan cultures is that kind of where you're going with that well yes but if you follow it back even further and you go back it all seemed to have stemmed from the negative fear virus that asserted itself on the planet because even i mean going all the way you know all the way back and even back to atlantis when the founder of atlantis created these human hybrid slaves that had very you know white white pale skin you know the, i mean of course those were that was a different time period than when there were pagans and things like that and before christianity so two different totally separate time periods but as Anawaya claimed, they were some of the earliest victims. But also it was interesting because Anawaya kept saying, kept allowing me to understand that that's part of the law when you incarnate on this planet, that there's a law of duality here. So you have to have the negative with the positive in order to grow in any way, you know, here on this planet. So the negative feeds into the positive and in a sense it's all one just like when you go into each person and you reach the same place so there was never anything that anyone considered bad about this it would just added to the experiment of what we're doing on the planet so to speak that's fascinating it was just a totally I'm, I'm different interested. perspective oh, sorry yeah no, it was a totally yeah, different I'm, perspective Oh um, yeah, I, I was gonna say I was I was like I, I'm I'm wondering what he told you about the star people and their connection to the star people because you hear from a lot of people that they had this connection to the star people like and I've heard like a lot of Native Americans elders like I mean going back to Art Bell um, Art Bell used to have a guy on named Red Elk he was a Native American elder and he would talk about the Native American connection to the star people uh, Clifford Mahudi. Um, who died, but he was a great speaker for the Native American people. Um, there, there's been a lot over time. Um, I remember the chief of the Hopi came on Art Bell as well back in the day, and he, they would talk about the Native American um, connection to the star people. Like, what did Anawaya tell you about their connection to the star people? Well, they had a very strong connection to the star people and their his tribe believed they came from the seven sisters. Um, they didn't say the Pleiades, but they considered it <clears throat> the Pleiades when they went to use, <clears throat> excuse me, Les's vocabulary. But they claimed that they came from there. And what was interesting is Les fell in love or Anawaya fell in love with a woman from a different tribe and they didn't, they were miles and miles away from one another. And they both had the same stories. They both interacted with the star people and they both knew where they came from. And um, Anawai claimed he came from the three in the uh, um, Orion's belt, but he also um, claimed that it was called um, a ladle, that it would scoop him up and take him at some point. All right, that's, that's one of the legends. And it was really interesting. Um, but they received a lot of help from the star people. They could contact the star people and the star people would um, not, they weren't allowed to interfere, but they could advise them. So it was a little bit upsetting to them when they wanted some advice when the white man came because they didn't know what to do about everything happening. And the star people just told them, you know, this is your choice that um, they can't interfere and that they really, the um, after talking to the star people, they decided they either had the choice to um, walk this trail to be forced out of their lands and carry their stories verbally, or they could leave and they could ascend. They were told by, um, I know it gets, really interesting but they were told by the little people the fairy people that they could go deep into the mountain into underground tunnels and they could basically ascend if they wanted to descend i'm sorry descend but go into another it is i never heard these stories i didn't even know about the little people until anna wyatt told me that that was just part of their culture that um 
they knew all about the little people, that they had a good relationship with the little people because the little people respected people that respected the earth. And they were able to see the little people, whereas white men could not, simply because it was still part of their belief system. So I thought that was interesting. So when something's not a part of your belief system, you can't see it anymore. Just like um, Anna Waya could see the star people, but you know the white men couldn't. Wow, this is amazing. Um, so I'm trying to think of where to go next with this. Whoa, we had a we had a couple questions from the audience. One thing I wanted to ask you was, um, it's not a, more related to the book, but it's more about like um, when 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 you do a quantum healing hypnosis session. I know you can see someone um, through Zoom, but do you prefer to do it in person? Do you get more of a connection when you do it in person, or is it just the same connection when you do it over uh, Zoom? Well, actually, um, QHHT is supposed to be done in person now. Maybe they'll change this, but for right now, it's supposed to be done in person. So I really don't know about that. Uh, okay. Uh, so so you're, 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 you're saying it should be done in person. Is it because you develop more um, of a connection and you can take someone deeper? No, it's just that that's how they run things. Um, QHHT practitioners are told to do things in person. And basically, I guess it's just um, to, because it would be too hard to monitor people doing Zoom sessions or um, just if it would be, I guess, safer. But that's just how they have it right now as well, far I mean, as uh, the, other practitioners. I'm sorry. That, the reason why I asked that is because I'm, I want to do a session where I want to go deep. Like I, I, I've done five regressions and I wouldn't say any of them were QHHT, but they were definitely all regressions. I definitely laid down and I was over zoom and someone regressed me and I went through the death scene and I experienced all kinds of stuff, but I, I couldn't start, stop help thinking to myself. I was like, man, I was like, if I do this in person, I might be able to go deeper. Like, I don't know. Like, I, I, I'm not sure about that. Like, what are your thoughts? Do you, is that, is there any, no? Definitely. I think anybody can go deeper if it's in person because, you know, you feel very safe and you've already, you know, gained trust with your practitioner and, you know, you're right there in front of them. So I think that would lead to feeling more safe personally. Yeah. That's that's awesome. And guys, if you have any questions for Sarah, just put them in the chat. We got one question. This one's from Boopster. She wants to know, she just says, um, how can you best focus on manifesting something positive if you're experiencing deep grief and loss? Well, you know, it's really fascinating, but, and I know this doesn't seem like it would be true, but actually deep grief and loss can lead to something amazing and beautiful. That's kind of how this realm this 3D realm that we're in right now works. Although mentally, many of us are in the fourth and fifth dimension, but not physically yet. But you can use deep grief and loss to your benefit. But really, essentially what the higher consciousness has said is you do that through feeling it, really going into it, really experiencing all that it has to give you. Because Things don't happen to you, they happen for you. So these things are like catalysts. It's almost like when you lose a job you think was your dream job only to find a better job. It's just how um, this reality works. So there's always a reason for these this deep grief and loss. Maybe it's teaching you something extremely valuable. Maybe you needed to catapult you to maybe help others through um, your own deep grief and loss, there's always some reason. And if you can find that reason, that can really benefit you. And then, you know, the possibilities are limitless, really. But That's I would say you don't need to switch your focus. You don't need to like go from feeling horrible to feeling great because it doesn't really work that way. It's best to feel the feelings, allow them to come up and see where that takes you. Just start trusting your inner self and your inner guidance and see where that's supposed to lead you. 
Yeah, I, I, I think like a lot of times, like like emotional pain can be a learning experience. Like I, I'm learning that myself. Like I, I'll just tell you, like I, my fans know this already. Like I'm going through a horrible breakup right now. I just lost my girlfriend oh, like no. a week and a half ago, and uh, I thought she was like my twin flame or my soulmate. I thought we were going to be together forever. And my fans are probably sick of hearing me say this, but like it was, it hurt me really bad because like you know when you really think that you have the one. Like you have that, yeah. well, you're married. So like you, I don't know, like, but like, I felt like I had the one that I was going to be with for the rest of my life. And now I'm looking back on the relationship and I'm like, well, okay, what could I have done better? Or what could I have changed to kind of, so I don't get myself into this position in the next relationship. Is it kind of like that? Is that like what life's about? Like learning lessons like that? Well, I mean, if you can figure, I mean, see, that's the thing. I mean, maybe there wasn't anything that you did wrong. Maybe this was just the end of your contract. Who knows? And maybe this isn't the end of your relationship either. You know, you never know. Maybe she had to go figure something out. You never know what it is. And it's not something that's, you know, that you did. You know what I mean? But yeah, that's how the that's how it works. That's how it works in this realm. And it's just everything leads us to something greater. Everything leads to something better. It just might not seem that way, but I know exactly what you mean. I remember dating like a million years ago <laughs> before <laughs> my husband. Yeah. And it's so it's so terrible. Breakups are just the worst. They're so they're so gut wrenching because it feels so devastating. And you, you think like, Oh, I, you know, I found the one and I feel so happy. Like I don't have to worry about that aspect of my life anymore. It's disappointing. Especially cause I'm, I'm not in a spring chicken. I'm 43. So like I was, I'm a, I feel like my biological clock's ticking and I wasn't thinking that I wanted to have kids, but I was like, I just knew that like, this was the person that I wanted to spend the rest of my life with. And I've already been through all the relationship drama. I've been through like insanity. So like, I thought this was definitely like, well, I'll, I'll get off the topic. I'm sorry. I shouldn't well, even run it, it on. Is, <laughs> but maybe it is maybe something she needs to do something or maybe this is the separation that causes her to really understand that this is what she wants. You never know. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I, we could do one more question, but this one is from Mel Tulip. Mel says, what does Sarah have to say about protection during sex sessions to avoid infiltration from negative beings giving false information? So the higher self and a, um, a negative being giving false information, they sound different. There's like a totally different way that they speak. The higher self is so intelligent. I mean, you're basically tapping into universal consciousness and it will use different words. It'll sometimes it, it's just, it's really interesting. It's like this all wise, all loving. You can tell because it's very loving and the information that comes out is is very positive. If there's some sort of false information or some sort of like negative consciousness kind of coming through, it'll, it won't speak like that. It won't have the same tone, the same frequency, the same feeling as when the higher consciousness comes through. You can feel it in the room almost when the higher consciousness comes through. It's like this great and powerful, loving energy. It's like, since everybody is God, it's almost like talking to God. And then there's a big difference between that and like the conscious mind. You don't feel that energy shift. It's definitely palpable. You can definitely feel it. Um, but also everybody has a higher self. Every, so everybody is protected if they ask for it. I mean, your guides and everybody that helps you, sometimes they get annoyed because they get bored if nobody asks them for help. I mean, they always tell my clients, we wish she would ask for help more or well, I don't know why he doesn't ask for this or that because we're just bored here. Or we're, we're, you know, assigned to him and we can't do anything unless we're asked. So a lot of times the guides will say they can't help unless they're asked. So if you feel like you want more protection, I would just ask because when you ask, they do help you. I was I was wondering about that. So so like is it easy like for for those people that like say like somebody can't afford to go get a regression done or say they can't just 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 say just for shits and giggles like could is it easy for us to like contact our higher self at home like by ourselves like um or at least try to 
to clear, create some clarity in our life? Oh my gosh, definitely. Like one thing you can do is right when you wake up in the morning and you can still remember your dream, that's deep hypnosis. That's the theta state. If you wake up in the morning and you can still remember your dream and you feel like you're not, because you still have access to your dream, you feel very relaxed. Your mind has less thoughts. That's a perfect time to just start the communication. Just ask a question, ask a question and wait for the very first thought. The very first thought is the higher self. And then that'll be the, the very first thought that answers and then write it down because when you're in that state, it's so easy to forget so quickly. Think you're always going to remember the answer. It was so fresh and clear in your mind, but then you wake up all the way and it's like, what happened to that? What happened? I, I knew the secrets of the universe and they're gone instantly. So yeah, anybody can do it. You don't even need to, to be in that state either. You can just try it out and ask a question and wait for the very first thought or the very first sense, the very first feeling that comes into your awareness. And that's the higher self. Wow. That's, this is awesome. Um, I guess the last question I would have is where do you see this going for like humanity as far as like the consciousness? Like, cause it does seem like we're going through a mass awakening. Like, what do you think the next stage of our evolution is? If you had to guess, oh like, Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm really excited because of what the higher consciousness has told me. Well, basically we're entering this stage, which I guess people don't really realize, but all the, so it's good and bad, I guess. On basically everything, since everybody's creating their own reality, everything is a reflection of their inner world. So if you work on yourself, your outer world will be a beautiful reflection. If you have unhealed trauma, it might be reflected reflected back at you in your outer world. And that's just another great opportunity to, what, to work on whatever it is. But inner work right now is one of the best things you can do because that's what I'm told constantly is work on your own self, basically, and that will help you going forward. That's one of the most powerful things anybody can do. Just follow your own emotions, follow your own intuitive guidance system. But essentially the higher self keeps saying that what's happening now is almost like a woman in labor. We're about to birth this new world. So essentially all of consciousness wants more unity. So we've been separated in order to come together better. We have difficulties in order to experience more peace. It's how um, cyclically things work on this realm. So, I mean, I'm excited for this future that the higher consciousness keeps talking about, where we'll be able to use telepathy, we'll be able to heal ourselves a lot better, we'll be able to use more of our um abilities that we haven't really tapped into before. And one thing that we will learn is how to use the subtle energies around us that basically you can start now and start building back these abilities that we haven't really experienced for so long, just by going in nature and starting to read nature through our bodies, not only just our mind, but through the subtle layers of our bodies and start to read the new information that's around because the fourth um, dimension is already here. We just collectively don't really understand how to tap into it, but you tap into it through the subtle, subtle energies and as soon as um, some of us basically come back online with our abilities and others will follow. And this is just going to be a really interesting experience because it's all new. This is fascinating. I'm excited for the future. Um, Me too. But uh, can you tell her, but thank you for doing this, by the way, this was awesome. And can you tell everybody where they can buy the new book, where they can buy your other books and where to find your website and all that. And again, thank you. This was amazing. Thank you so much. I really enjoy being on the, on your show. Um, you can go to my website, theholistichypnotist.com, and you can buy all my hypnotist journey books on Amazon. Um, the I'm going to. I don't have any sessions available because I'm booked really far in advance. But the next time I will be doing private sessions is on the Hidden Secrets Cruise, which is going to be really great. I'm um, booking private sessions on that cruise, but there's going to be a lot of really interesting 
speakers on that cruise. Um, Jason Sherka and uh, Linda Moulton Howe, Laura Eisenhower, just to name a few. I don't know. They're, that sounds really awesome. I didn't even know that was going on. Yeah, it's going to be going um, out of L.A. through the Mexican Riviera. So that's really exciting. So, yeah, you can find out about um, the different events and different places um, on my website. But I'm just, you know, I'm really glad the higher consciousness wants to use me because it honestly is a lot of fun for me. And it's really exciting. I can't wait to find out what they're going to share with me next. You know, I've already started my fourth book. But, yeah, you can buy um, any of my stuff on Amazon and off my website. Well, as soon as you come out with your next book, I definitely want to have you back on for another show because this was amazing. Like, and I'm such a big fan of QHHT. Like, and I think you're one of the best at it. So, well, well, there's practitioners all over the world. You can go to QHHT, QHHTofficial.com and find somebody in your area. And I mean, this method was developed by Dolores Cannon and it works really well. So there's yeah. tons of people out there. Yeah. All right. Well, um, thank you, Sarah. And thank you, everybody, for 